Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Are you all right, June? Oh. It's lovely to see you all here at Witten Baptist on this Sunday morning. If you're visiting us, uh, welcome. Very warm welcome to you. And uh, it's lovely to be together as we worship God. For those of you online, good morning to you. And I uh, hope that the service will be a blessing to you. And if you're watching on Catch Up again, I uh, hope this service will really speak to your hearts and you'll find something really beneficial as you listen to God's word and as we sing and as we praise this morning. You received your notice sheet as you came in. Um, just to remind you of a, a few things, uh, we'll see our prayer meeting on Tuesday evening, community cafe on Wednesday and then next Sunday's morning worship. Just had a few extra notices. Um, we were very sad to hear the death of Harry Clay. Um, I heard yesterday that Harry's funeral will be on the 23rd of May. That's Tuesday, the 23rd of May at 2 o'clock at Waldronfield Baptist. So if that's if interested of, of any of you who would like to go to that. Can we pray for Vernon this morning? Um, Shirley, uh, he's, in, he's in hospital. Please pray mm. for him. Mm. Had an update this morning from Astrid that Val is back in hospital her breathing's not at all good. So Val, I'm sure you're watching us, or if not, I know you'll watch it on Catch Up. We miss you, we love you, and we're really praying that you will get well. And I think the phrase was, you're fed up, and I'm not surprised you've been in and out of hospital. So we do love you, and we're praying for you. A reminder also that this Thursday, there is a life group at Sarah's. So please, if you're part of that group, uh, please go along to that. We do continue to pray for our world um, it's easy to forget uh, Ukraine, isn't it, with all the other things that are going on with the coronation, etc. But uh, the war in Ukraine is still going on and uh, Russia is trying to get its hold there. But Ukraine is doing well. And we just pray that um, we do pray that God will overrule in all of that. And please remind you of the coronation party that we have in uh, three, is it two weeks time now, isn't it? It's coming up fast on Sunday, the 7th of May from 12.30 to 3.30. If you can deliver some leaflets, there are bundles in the foyer, not many left, that's wonderful to see. Please, if you could take them and just pop them through the doors to encourage um, people of the local area to come in. We are clashing with an event on White House Park. I got their leaflet the other day through my door. So, uh, but uh, we can do it, we can both, they can do both events, can't mm -hmm. we? So. We'll have a, a fantastic afternoon. We've got a bouncy castle and lots of food, a barbecue. It's all free, so we can encourage families and people to come in, people on their own, just to get through those gates or that, you know, come up the path into the doors to realise that it's a lovely place here. We're not strange people. We are a bit odd. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but we're people who love Jesus, and that's something to be praised for. And, um, yeah. Please, if you can take any of those or put an A4 poster in your window, please do. Uh, we do remember as well, Margaret. Margaret hasn't been good the last few weeks, has she, Kevin? And remember her with continuing ME. She really does suffer, and we're missing her. Margaret, we're missing you this morning, and we do pray for you that uh, you'll be back with us very soon and uh, enjoy your playing again. Right, that's enough of me. I'll hand over to Cole. Thank you. Thank you. Talking of strange people... <laughs> how is it that Sunday, no matter how much you prepare for it during the week, always happens at a rush? You notice that? You know, I was up early this morning to get loads of stuff done, arrived here and suddenly realised I forgot, left three things back in the house and it's been massive chaos rushing around ever since then. And it's part of it, I'm pretty sure, is because, you know, S Sundays can be a busy day, but also because Satan wants to get in there and disrupt it and stop you focusing. You know, Fiona and I discovered this very early in our marriage. And we had two young boys, and we discovered we had often had a row on the way to church on Sunday. <laughs> what great preparation, you know, for worship. We had a row. And then it, when, when I went into ministry, um, uh, we discovered that we'd often have a row on Saturday to just stop me preparing for Sunday. And we suddenly realized, you know, Satan a, is, is a master of mischief and, and deception, and he wants to stop you looking above and calming down, and taking that deep breath, and as they often say in this day and age, take time to smell the coffee. That's what we do on Sunday. When we come into church, we're taking time to just breathe. Not just breathe the air, 
but breathe in our God. You know, it's very interesting, the word Holy Spirit, ruach, literally means breath. That's what it means in both the Hebrew and in the Greek. It means breath. And as Christians, he is our life breath. He is the one we need to breathe in and then keep that breath and hold on to it and keep on breathing in God and preparing ourselves. So we're going to do that this morning. And we're going to read again the same psalm that we read last Sunday and, we, and the psalm that we actually used in our reading service because it's a critical psalm and it's very important to today's theme and message. So I'd like to invite you to turn with me to Psalm 22. Psalm 22. It's a psalm that we're told um, was written to the tune of the Doe of the Morning. We haven't got a clue what that song is like, the Doe of the Morning. I'm looking forward to discovering when we get to heaven just what that tune sounds like. And you can read the psalm to it, to it. It's a psalm of David. And here the psalmist David writes, he says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from my cries of anguish? My God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer by night, but I find no rest. Yet you are enthroned as the Holy One. You are the one Israel praises. In you our ancestors put their trust. They trusted you and you delivered them. To you they cried out and they were saved. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by everyone, despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They hail insults, shaking their heads. He trusts others, so he trusts in the Lord, they say. Let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him, since he delights in him. Yet you brought me out of the womb. You made me trust in you, even at my mother's breast. From birth I was cast on you. From my mother's womb you have been my God. Do not be far from me, for trouble is near and there is no one to help. Many bulls surround me, strong bulls of Bashan encircle me, roaring lions that tear their prey open, so tear their prey, open their mouths wide against me. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart has turned to wax. It is melted within me. My mouth is dried up like a pot's herd. And my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You lay me in the dust of death. Dogs surround me. A pack of villains encircle me. They pierce my hands and my feet. All my bones are on display. People stare and gloat over me. They divide my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. Who is this? This is our God, the one we worship. You know, often when we, people talk about God, and there's been various theories about God, that put God so far away, so removed from human suffering and pain, and yet the Bible tells us that is not the God of the Bible. That is not the living God. The living God came down here and lived among us. The living God died the most horrific and terrible death for you and for me. So let's focus on him as we come into this church and we're going to stand and sing together that lovely old hymn, And Can It Be?
he pulls you down. He whispers in your ear, you're not good enough. Why are you coming before God? He doesn't want to hear from you. You're a nobody. Not only you're a nobody, you are a sinful nobody, which makes you a somebody, but God doesn't want to know. No condemnation now I dread. Jesus and all in him is mine. Alive in him, my living head, and clothed in righteousness divine. We don't come here on Sunday mornings or in our prayer times because we are good enough. We come because he is good enough. And because he died for you and paid the price of your sin and my sin. And he clothes us in his righteousness and by his sin, by his stripes, his being struck for us, we are healed. Let's bow our heads and speak to God in prayer. Father God, we come before you now and we thank you that we come here in the name of Jesus. We thank you, Father God, we come here because of your Son, because, Father, he died in our place, because he hung upon that tree, because, Father God, he suffered hideously and died following your will in our place, our sins, our wrongdoing, our corruption, is nailed to that cross, and by his stripes, we are healed. Father, we thank you we can come into this place because of Jesus. We can come into this place because of his sacrifice. We can come into his place because, Father, we don't save ourselves. You save us when we come to you and repent of our sins and ask you, Lord Jesus, into our lives. Lord, we come before you and we thank you for that reality and that fact and father we pray for anyone here or online who feels they're not good enough even though they've given their hearts to you we pray father that they may know no condemnation now they dread lord may they look to you lord jesus and may this service be one when we all look to you and see in you your great love, and see in you your great passion, and see in you just how important we are to you, Lord. Lord, we thank you for life. We thank you for the wonder of life. We thank you, Father, for the, the conversation baby is having with you right this moment. The joy of that, the beauty of that. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you are a, a glorious God. And we pray, Lord, as we come into this place, by your Holy Spirit, help us, Lord, to see more of you. Help us, Lord, to put aside those concerns and those worries, those things that will divert our attention, divert our gaze from looking at you. Put it always aside, Lord, and help us to look up and to worship, to look up and to glorify your name, to look up and to praise your name, to look up and to thank you for all you've given us. And looking up, Lord, we may be bathed in the light of your glory and of your holiness. And you may make us more like you. Continue to work in us, dealing with those parts of our lives that we struggle with, those besetting sins, those problems, those doubts, that we may grow to reflect your light and have the confidence we need as your people. Lord, we pray may bless this time. Be with us, each one. Be with those who are watching online. And bless this time. We ask, Lord Jesus, because we gather in your name to your glory. Amen. Amen. Julia mentioned that we've got these leaflets, and there are still some streets being done. I do encourage you, if you haven't taken some already, or if you haven't fancy doing some more deliveries, then please do take these and put them around the streets that are nominated. There's also a supply of them there to take to family and friends. So please do take some and give out and make people know that it's going to happen. It's a, a free event, as Julia mentioned. That's fantastic. You know, uh, the, the other event in White House Lane, it's nothing compared to ours because we're offering free food and we've got God's presence here as well. A double blessing, physical and spiritual uh, blessing in this place. So please do, do put the word around. And on Tuesday, we've got, a, we've got our prayer meeting um, and we're hoping to find the, the, the final roads that are there for a few of us to go out under prayer cover of that, that group to deliver 
and to pray around the streets. And I do encourage you, if you and I were doing a couple of streets this week, when you do go around, just pray for the streets, pray for the houses. As you put it through a letterbox, pray for whoever on the other side of that letterbox. Pray for the families and that God may speak to this community and bring people to know and to love him. One of the things we mentioned on the, the church meeting on uh, Tuesday um, was that we, we still needing people to um, put their names forward and come out for our Sizewell weekend at the end of, um, uh, the end of August. Um, what's exactly the dates? If you can remind me of the dates. Sorry, the... First of the first, so it's the first few t- days, thank you, first of the third in September, it's in my diary, but it's not in my mind, uh, first of the third, um, and in order to show you a bit more about Sizewell, I've got downloaded this promotional video from Sizewell, and if you've never been to Sizewell, you're absolutely in for a treat. Now this video was made in the middle of the um, uh, COVID, and it's the last promotional video it did, so it does mention COVID, and at the time, it talks about what's been going on, and it talks about the fact it's been closed over COVID, and the gates are going to open. So if you can ignore that little section, but actually focus on the bigger publicity as it talks about the work of Sizewell Hall. Thank you. Hello, welcome to Sizewell Hall, um, that special place by the sea. Um, it's been a special place for over 45 years now, and uh, we're hoping to, to maintain that for another 45 years, perhaps 50 years, uh, as we look to the future. Um, it's a place where many call home, even more than a second home. So people's lives have been blessed by God. Uh, by coming here, they've um, initiated a relationship with God and they've also maintained a relationship and just renewed their their lifelong belief um, uh, in the saving grace of God. Many folk feel God's presence here and uh, personal relationships, friendships are, are generated and sustained. Um, I've even read in the visitor's book that uh, a couple here met and got engaged and, and got married subsequently. So. Uh, God's God's hand at work. So I know there's been a few um, IT and uh, online um, newsletters from Sizewell Hall, um, the November newsletter particularly, um, sort of laid out the situation we find ourselves in with COVID and uh, we rely on your prayer support, but we also rely on your financial support. Uh, so in recent days, there's been a give net page uh, put online and your generosity has been overwhelming. Um, we are seeking to raise £50,000 to sustain the hall until uh, next March. We just have a, a, a desire to move forward and by cutting back that uh, we can sustain the hall uh, for your benefit, for your safe return in, in hopefully the, the early months of next year. So um, following the current lockdown, we do hope to, to open up to yourselves uh, to enable you to, to come here and, and stay with us and enjoy the surroundings, the sea and the hall um, and of course God's presence here and uh, we trust that that feeling of just driving through those gates um, and driving down to the hall um, and that just that you hear it so many times that people just see it, feel settled and at peace once uh, they are through those gates they leave the, the world's troubles behind. I do encourage you, if you haven't yet filled in your form, please do it, hand it to Louise or to Angela so we can get as many names as possible to come to what should be a very special and precious chance to breathe 
as a community and get to know each other better in the wonderful surroundings of Sizewell Hall. Right, boys and girls, do you want to come down the front? I want to talk to you today. And I have a, a simple question to ask. It's a very, very simple question. And the question is this, are you thirsty? Who's thirsty this morning? Put your hands up. Anyone thirsty? Just one, two people, okay, right. So if you're thirsty, okay, you've got a, a variety of different things we can have. So we have got here some Fanta, some Diet Coke, and we've got here some Pepsi Max. So a whole variety of kind of things you can have if you're thirsty. Who fancies some Fanta? Or some Pepsi Max? Anyone fancy that? Okay, well, no, no one seems to fancy it. This is one of my favorites. Diet Coke. But actually, I don't drink this really if I'm thirsty. I mean, I drink it if I want to drink. But I don't really tend to drink it if I'm thirsty because it's full of gas. If you drink it too fast, it makes you want to burp, which is not a pleasant experience, trust me. Um, and it's not the most thing... The best thing if you're thirsty. So if you're thirsty, we have got here some wonderful H2O. Who fancies a glass of water? A glass of water. You fancy a glass of water? Are you thirsty? Have you thirsty? Okay. Right. This is the best thing if you're thirsty. This kind of uh, solution with no carbon in there that hasn't been carbonated, made gassy. Okay. It's the best way to drink. Okay. But the problem is. You can drink this if you're thirsty, but if you're really, really thirsty and you've got none of this available, not like this, I wonder just how thirsty you really are. Because I've got here this. It's a bit of moss from the garden. Our garden here in the church. It's all, fr it's all homegrown. Smells quite fresh. The water's from the tap, so it's 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 um, local local water. But who fancies a drop of this? No one. We're well, not really very thirsty, are you? Because if you're really, really, really thirsty, this is water. It's water. And in fact, what you need to do, if you're really, really thirsty, is you. Get a cloth like this. Best is li best to have linen, but something like that, okay. And you pour this into the cloth, Look at that. <laughs> Isn't that better? You're thirsty. You need to drink. You've got to hydrate. People die of dehydration. Okay? And about 20 minutes ago, I put one of these in there. And these are the tablets that are issued to us in the army. They are sodium dichloro urinate. I can't be so urinate, it's cy cy cyronate. <laughs> a 17 milligram tablet, a very small tablet you put in there and it takes away the germs itself and that's it there and it takes 10 minutes, I put it in about 20 minutes ago, so by now it should be okay. Who wants to drop? Yeah? Well done, Ben. Anyone else have a drop? Yeah, okay. Just sip it slowly. Anyone else? Tastes pretty disgusting, doesn't it? It's not too bad, actually, not too bad. 
But basically, we filtered out the worst bits of dirt and mess that you've got out there. And this was a kind of like, it makes it taste a bit like TCP. Not particularly brilliant for you, but it should stop you dying. <laughs> and the important thing here is, is that, you know, actually if you're really, really thirsty, if you really, really are thirsty, you will drink whatever you can that provides moisture into your body. And you will take water from the puddles or from um, a, a pond, or for somebody, no, normally as a climber, you only take water from a, a stream above 2,000 feet, and you normally take it from the white water this, where it's been oxygenated. That's the safest way to drink it. But if you're in the lowlands and you're desperate and you've got no moisture and you're about to pass out because you may have heat stroke, you will take anything if you're really, really thirsty. In truth, most of us here have never really been that thirsty. And having lived in the Middle East, I can tell you, you know, if you go through a sandstorm, for example, you know, that literally cakes you in sand, and it's like standing inside a, an oven, with someone blowing a, a lots of heat onto you, it dries your eyes out, the sand gets into your eyes, it makes your eyes all gritty, but it gets into your nostrils and into your throat, and the end of that, you are absolutely parched. You want anything to have a drink, to hydrate, even if it's not the best water. And Jesus, on the cross, said this. Thank you. He said this. He said, I am thirsty. He'd been on the cross for around about six hours by that stage. He was hanging there on the cross, and he was in the full heat of the sun. He wasn't in any shadow or any shade. He was hanging there, and the sun was beating down upon him. For six hours, he'd just carried his cross. He'd been up all night. He'd been scourged, had a crown of thorns put on his, on his head. He'd been beaten, spat at, and abused. And here, after six hours, from nine to around about three o'clock in the afternoon, hanging on the cross, just before he dies, he shouts out, I am thirsty. Why was Jesus on the cross? Why was Jesus on the cross? Who can tell me? Yes? Yeah, exactly right, because some people didn't like him. Yes, that's right. And why didn't they like him? But he didn't like him because he was gone, Ben. Yeah, they didn't think he was correct. He was preaching a different gospel because their news wasn't, their, 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 their gospel wasn't gospel. It was bad news and not good news. And he was, actually, he was actually pointing out that what they were doing to the people wasn't what, what God wanted the people to hear. You see, Jesus was on the cross because of you and because of me. He hung on that cross because he was hanging in our place. And when he shouted or croaked, I am thirsty, he was doing that for you. And he's doing that for me. You know, whenever we talk about the cross or look at crosses or, and hear about crosses, don't forget the human reality of the cross. The great pain and suffering that God did because you are precious to him. And because I am precious to him. Let's speak to God in prayer. Lord, as we come before you now, we thank you, Lord, that you died upon the cross for us. And we thank you, Lord Jesus, for you experienced that incredibly painful thirst because of us. We thank you, Lord, that you experienced that death so that we wouldn't have to. But you went to the cross so we wouldn't need to. That you, Lord Jesus, died in our place, in my place. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Help us to realize just how much it took you. Help us, Lord Jesus, to give you the glory and to give you our hearts. We ask, Lord Jesus, in your name. Amen. Thanks, boys and girls. You can go back to your seats. I'm going to ask the band to come back to the front, please. And we're going to sing our next two songs.
I cast my mind and Savior of the world.
we should be doing oh. those sheet of days. Oh, sorry. I do apologise. <laughs> would help, wouldn't it? <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> Didn't hear Rich. Well, so lovely. Well done, the programme. <laughs> oh, yes, you are right. Yeah. You are. <laughs> yeah, we are doing that one. We are. All oh, right. Which one are we doing? <laughs> Which one are we doing? Yeah, go back. Stay here in the world. Right, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, we'll sing the third chorus. Okay, so I'm going to start again. <coughs> I'll try to take it down a bit, and I think it's thrown it off. We must spread the word of this.
we're going to come to our prayers, but before we do that, I'm going to spring myself unwelcomely upon someone in the congregation because this Sunday is a particularly important Sunday for them because it's going to be their last Sunday for a while. Nathan, Nathaniel, sorry, Nathan, Nathaniel, come up. I want to, we want to pray for you as a church. Just want, before we do that, not everyone will know what is happening in your life. So can you take that microphone? So something, something interesting has happened this week. What's happening? on yeah uh, next Sunday I am um, going off to join the army um, doing my first well, soldier development course first um, and then basic training after that uh, for 28 weeks so it's full 32 weeks in total right so, so what, what, what's the regiment you're hoping to join eventually? Uh, Coldstream Guards. Coldstream Guards. He's got the height for it, hasn't he, really? So, <laughs> and, he, and he's, got, he, he, he's getting there, isn't he? Getting, yeah, he's kind of <laughs> the Coldstream Guards. Yes. And where are they currently based, do you know? Um, Wellington Barracks in London. Wellington Barracks. So that's, that's the really ugly-looking bar barracks yeah. right next to Buckingham Palace. Yes. But it's great because if you actually stay in, in the barracks, as I have done, you can actually pull your curtains open and you've got Buckingham Palace right there bef before you. So it's a, nice. it's a lovely place. And it's right next to St. James's Park and all the green beauty of, um, of that area. So that's, that's fantastic. Right. So there'll be a lot of drill for you. Yes. Have you started practicing marching? Um. <laughs> 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 oh, that, that's a no then. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, so, yeah. <laughs> Okay. Practicing uh, standing on walks with my left foot. So. Okay, right. So, you, okay. As, as, uh, yeah, it's, it takes a while. It's like anything practicing makes perfect. I've seen this man out running. I've been, out, I've been up, up, uh, up and down in, in, into this area. I, I go around the corner one day and I saw this him coming back red, very red faced, um, but, but bouncing along with the vigor of youth back into, his, back into his house. So it's really great to see. And what we need to do as a church, because this is a big, big thing, he's going away from home, he's going to train as a soldier, um, and then hopefully go into eventually the Coldstream Guards. Um, and so he's going to need our prayer support and our cover. So I'd encourage every one of you to make Nathaniel a matter for prayer over the next 32 weeks altogether, isn't it? Yes. So we really pray for him that God will give him strength, he will learn the drill, he will learn the, all the other techniques and the skills he needs to become part of the British Army and become a soldier. And I'm hoping you're going to come back from time to time, perhaps even in uniform, and tell us how you're getting on so we can pray for you more. We're going to pray for you now. You. Is that okay? Father, we thank you for Nathaniel. Lord, we thank you for his faith. We thank you for his life. And Father God, as he now goes to make this massive step and explores a career in the Army, we just pray, Father God, for you to go with this young man. Lord, fill him with your spirit. Give him confidence. May he learn lots of skills over the next few months. May he have the confidence, Lord, to take up this role proudly and do well in it. Lord, give him strength. Give him the physical strength and the stamina he needs to do all the training, the physical side of it. Give him the mental acridity to actually deal with all the new subjects and the new, new things he'll be learning, all the acronyms that go with military life. Father, bless him. We pray, Father, he may make some good friends and find some Christian friends and Christian fellowship, Father, both in training and in Wellington Barracks. Lord, go with him. Protect him. Keep him safe. Keep him physically safe and keep him spiritually safe. And bless him. Lord, we thank you for him. Go with him. We ask, Lord Jesus, in your holy name. Amen. So let's continue to pray and remember Nathaniel over these weeks and months ahead. And now we're going to turn our minds to other prayer matters. So let's continue praying. Let's bow our heads and pray together. Father, we come before you now and we thank you, Lord, that we can come before you with our prayers and bring before you, Father, our own situations and the situations of the world. And we want to pray, continue to pray for the Ukraine. We pray, Father, for the end of that war. We pray, Father God, that you may bring an end to this conquest attempt by Russia. We pray, Father God, that if Putin cannot be changed, if he cannot turn his mind, we pray you may replace him, Father, and put in power someone who will and will bring peace to Russia and peace uh, to the Ukraine. We pray, Father, you may bless the leadership of the Ukrainian government. We pray, Father, you may bless their armies, 
and bless all those who are seeking to repair the damage and the harm that's been caused by this invasion. Lord, we pray may bring an end to this conflict and be with all those who are serving in that particular theatre and be with those who have lost their homes and have lost loved ones. Father, be in that situation, we pray. And also, Lord, this week we think of Sudan, what used to be called North Sudan. And we pray, Father, for Sudan, that northern part of Eastern Africa. And we pray for that nation too, Father, that's going currently through what seems to be some kind of civil war. And we pray, Father, we may bring peace to that part of the world as well. Lord, South Sudan has been in a civil war for around about 15 years now, torn apart by a very bloody conflict. And we pray, Father, that you may bring peace to north and to south in Sudan and bring an end to this tireless warmongering that comes by the power seeking to de de depose those people of opposite groups at great cost to the people of East Africa. Lord, bring an end to that conflict, we pray. And we pray you may bless the relief agencies that will be seeking to bring both first aid and help, Father, to those families that have been damaged and torn apart by this conflict. We think of those, Father, closer at home who need our prayers, and we do bring up to you, uh, bring before you, Lord, our sister Val. Lord, she's been in and out of hospital. She had lots of different infections. She, she's caught COVID this week, and Father, she's just been really going through the mill. And so, Father, we want to pray for Val right now. Father, go put your hand upon that lady. Lord, breathe, Lord Jesus, your healing into her. Breathe your faith into her. Breathe your peace into her. Breathe your presence. Lord, bless Val, we pray, please. Be with her, Father. And Father, we also want to pray for, for Megan, who is David's niece, who's been diagnosed with having uh, cancer, stage 3 cancer. Lord, Megan sometimes comes along to our community cafe, bringing her daughter, Eleanor, who's two years old. She's only a young woman, Father, really young. We want to pray, Lord, for Megan. We pray, Father God, you may put your hand upon her. We pray, Father God, for healing for Megan. And we pray for David and his sister. We pray for Megan herself and for baby Eleanor. And we pray, Father, that you may just work in this situation. Lord, bring healing Bring peace. And Father, we want to pray for our area here. We thank you, Father. We're looking forward to celebrating our new king's coronation on the 7th of May here in the church on that coronation weekend. And Father, we pray for the event we're ho uh, hosting here. It's going to be a celebration coronation party. And we pray, Father, you may call many people in the local area to come along to our party to enjoy food, to get to know and meet us as a church, to enjoy the craft and the games in the, in the, in the, in the garden, to enjoy the bouncy castle and, and perhaps having a massage or doing some face painting or doing some craft work or having a cup of tea and cake next door or enjoying the barbecue. Father, we pray that this event may be a great event, but Lord, particularly to bring grace to this area. Lord, we're seeking, Father, just to reflect your love and your goodness, offering people something for nothing. Grace, trying to reflect your love. And Lord, though, Lord, it's a poor reflection in one sense of how great your love is. We pray you may use this offering of ours, Father, to reach the hearts and minds of families around us in the streets and lanes of, of, White ha of, um, of, of, of Witten, Father, and of Castle Hill. Father God, we pray you may pour out your spirit on this area and bring many people into knowing, into knowing you, Lord, and experiencing the, the joy and the wonder and the peace that comes through knowing you. So, Lord, just bless this time, we pray, Father. Bless that particular event over that weekend and help us as a church as we prepare for it. And, Father, we also want to bring before you people known to us, perhaps family members or friends, People we're worried about. And in a moment of quietness now, we bring their names before you. Lord, hear these our prayers. We ask them all in the name of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, 
who taught us to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. We're going to sing our offertory hymn, which is Ancient of Days. And during the singing of this song, the children will go out to their classes. Thank you. This is a new song written by the same team who wrote that lovely hymn, um, Yet Not I But Christ Through Me. If we all sing, we'll sing through the first verse for you and with you if you know it. And then if you can stand to sing, we'll start all over again. It's, it's a very easy tune, lovely words, and I hope that will just add to your, your uh, worship this morning. <laughs>
Thank you. Please take your seats. And turn with me, please, to John chapter 19. John chapter 19, reading verses 23 to verse 30. 23 to verse 30. When the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes, dividing them into four shares, one for each of them, with the undergarment remaining. This garment was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. Let's not tear it, they said to one another. Let's decide by lot who will get it. This happened, that the scripture might be fulfilled that said, they divided my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. So this is what the soldiers did. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to her, Woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, this disciple took her into his home. Later, knowing that everything had now been finished and so that scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant, and lifted it to Jesus' lips. When he received the drink, Jesus said, It is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. May God bless to us now that reading of his word. And so we've been going through a series on the seven I, the seven sayings from the cross, the seven cries from the cross. And today we come to the fifth cry, I am thirsty. I am thirsty. I can remember, Trev's not here this morning, but I can remember uh, doing a long walk with Trev. We did the Derrant Watershed Walk. Oh, good grief. Uh, it was before I went in the army, so it must have been about 30 odd years ago now and Derrick Watershed's a, a great part of the Peak District I, I love mountains and what have you and, and I thought it'd be a good way to do it it's a good good kind of uh, 42 mile trek so we did it over two days I had various hills in between and um, on the very very first day we'd done a long long distance we'd done something in a region of around about 20 22 miles carrying Rupp Bergens and, and, and our tent or my tent in the back of it and um, Having got at a particular uh, point, we, we, we rested after this long walk and we put the tent up. It had been drizzling a wee bit, some sunshine, drizzled, drizzled a wee bit. And we'd run out of water. And one of the things is Derrick Watershed surrounds several reservoirs up in the Peak District. But there's very, very few streams. And we'd run out of water and we needed water to cook. Um, well, I needed water to cook and, um, for, for Trev. And so, um, so we basically got the tent up and, uh, and, uh, and I put Trev, my brother, brother in the tent. And I began then, and I looked on the map and I could see there was a very, very small pool of water about, I don't know, about a mile and a half from where we were. So using my compass, I took a bearing on it from where we are in the tent, left Trevor in the tent and went to find this pool. And as I discovered, it was a bit like a crater. It was kind of, it went, went on and on and on, an undulating terrain, a lot, lot of heather and gorse. And eventually I dropped down into this like crater area. And the very bottom of this crater, there was this pool. He said it wasn't a kind of lush, beautiful blue pool with birds, you know, dipping themselves into and getting the fish. It was a kind of, green hole of water. It was literally, literally, it was, it was green. And so I filled up the bottles I had of water, about two liters of this green water, and I took it back up to Trev. And Trev, even to this day, pretends he thought I was messing around because when I got up to back up to the, the top on the, on the moor, the mist came down. I couldn't see the tent. And Trev was inside. He had, he had had a little doze and what have you. And he woke up every now and again hearing this voice saying, Trev, Trev, are you there? And he thought I was messing around. So he didn't bother to answer. And so for about 45 minutes, I wandered around trying to find my tent. And my brother was laying in there thinking it was, but I was messing around with him. And in fact, I was the one treasuring around to get this, this, um, this water. But we used these tablets, put a couple of them in it, let, them, let, them, let it, let it uh, dissolve and what have you, gave it a good shake. And we made very green mashed potato with it and cooked it 
on the, on the fold. But the, the point is, is that when you are thirsty, when you are really, really thirsty, you will drink whatever you can drink. And Jesus on the cross, he cries or he croaks out, I am thirsty. I am thirsty. And in the literal scheme of things, this is the fifth cry that comes from the mouth of Jesus. And it's the cry first, but it's more than that because it is actually part of the cry of death of Jesus. And this cry is unique to John's gospel, which is interesting because John seems to be at pains in John's gospel to show Jesus as, as the mighty Son of God, as the Messiah, as one of John's, John's aims to demonstrate he's the mighty Son of God, and yet only he has this very human cry of Jesus, I am thirsty. And what this cry shows us in this passage, first and foremost, is this. There's a plan afoot. It shows us God's plan. Because with this cry, we hear of the son's suffering, and we see that God's plan is being fulfilled. You see, the Old Testament is full of prophecies about the coming of the Messiah. The Messiah, Hebrew word for the chosen one, the anointed one. Christ is the Greek word for the chosen one, the anointed one. They both mean the same. And the Old Testament is full of promises or prophecies about how the Messiah, God's chosen one, will come. And these prophecies were, writ were written at least 600 years, 600 years before Jesus would ever be born of the woman Mary. Psalm 22, verse 18, gives us several of them. And in Psalm 22, what we read earlier on, there's a whole series of prophecies that relate to the crucifixion we find in this very poignant psalm. Jesus John himself draws attention to the fact in verses 24 and 28 and refers to the two events that he mentions as happening because they are fulfilling the prophecies of the Old Testament. First, he notes the dividing of the garments of Jesus and the plain of lots at the foot of the cross. But it's predicted in Psalm 22 and verse 18 that says, They divide my garments among them and cast lots for my clothing. Now, this is a psalm of David, Psalm 22. And David is the king of Jerusalem. And it's very, very unlikely that David is speaking of personal experience. Some of the prophetic psalms he is. And you see the way that in which the death and the, and the life of Jesus mirrors some of the things that happens in the life of David. But this particular psalm is unlikely to be da David speaking of his own experience. It's more likely to be some kind of prophetic role that David is playing in writing this psalm. Another example happens later on in this passage where jo John mentions in John 19, 28, it says, Later, knowing that everything had now been finished, and so that the scripture will be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. I am thirsty. It's key to see here that John, as in, as in, in company of all the other gospel writers, sees Jesus as fulfilling the prophecies we find in the Old Testament about the Messiah. In fact, if you were to look at Psalm 22, you will find nine direct prophecies fulfilled in that psalm alone. Nine. So, for example, Psalm 22, it tells us the terrible cry of Jesus. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In verse 1. It tells of the awful mocking of Jesus. Verses 7 to 8, all who see me mock me. They hurl insults, shaking their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him since he delights in him. It tells of the terrible pain of crucifixion. As your limbs are literally pulled out of their sockets, I am poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. What's interesting to note is that crucifixion had not been invented when this psalm was written. It was a means of death that was invented during the Roman, uh, during the Roman Emperor, uh, Empire. And the Roman Empire didn't start to several hundred years, about three to four hundred years after this psalm was written. Very interesting. 
It tells of his rasping thirst. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. Verse 15. It tells of the high priest and his cronies that encircle the cross and watch Jesus die. Dogs have surrounded me. A band of evil men have encircled me. Verse 16. It tells of the nails used to fix him to the cross again. You know, this is before crucifixion existed. They have pierced my hands and my feet. It tells of how Jesus hung naked upon the cross for public humiliation. I count all my bones. People stare and gloat over me. You were crucified naked. Crucifixion had not been invented when David writes this psalm. It tells of the soldiers dividing the garments among themselves. They divide my garments among them. It tells that these men also cast lots. They cast lots for my clothing. This is about the death of Jesus. Now, some people have said, well, Jesus could have fulfilled some of the prophecies by enacting them. But he was, this was out of his control to be crucified, to have his garments uh, divided beneath him, to be nailed to a cross. This was outside of his control. He couldn't manufacture this up. In fact, Pilate didn't even want to, to crucify him. He wanted to set him free. This was because he was living out the plan that God had for him. Then you turn to Psalm 69, another psalm that particularly relates to this fourth, uh, fifth cry. It tells of how Christ, Christ's thirst was quenched. They put gall in my food and gave me uh, vinegar for my thirst. Verse 21. Psalm 69, again, it tells of the rejection of Jesus by his natural brothers and by the children of Mary. I am a stranger to my brothers and an alien to my own mother's son. Verse 8. And finally, it tells of the passion that led to Jesus clearing the temple. Zeal for your house consumes me, and the insults of those who insult you fall on me. Now, prophecy is a very, very difficult occupation. Never wants to become a prophet. Because if you get it wrong, and you're most likely to get it wrong, then you're going to be in a lot of, lot of trouble. And it's something that the Bible makes very clear. If God calls people to be a prophet, then you're, the confirmation of the prophecy will be the fact that it happens as it is given, not that it happens slightly. It's fascinating. People talk about Nostradamus. I don't know if you've ever read, I've read some of the writings of Nostradamus just out of interest. And the, the, the prophecies of Nostradamus are so vague, so terribly vague. I've just given you 12 prophecies, 12 that are not vague, but are very clear, but are fulfilled in Jesus Christ. You know, if you want to t challenge people, say, you believe in Nostradamus, look at Psalm 22. There are nine prophecies written at least 600 years before Jesus was even born that are fulfilled in the death of Jesus Christ. You want to believe Nostradamus? You've got to believe Jesus Christ. Because this isn't vague. This is very direct and clear fulfillments. Now, prophecy is no easy thing. And if I was to say to you tomorrow night, someone's going to knock at your door, you're going to say to me, big deal. Of course, tomorrow night, someone may knock at my door. But if I say to you, someone is going to knock at your door tomorrow night, and they're going to knock at your door, and I predict, I'm going to prophesy, they're going to knock at your door at 9 p.m. exactly, then the odds begin to get greater, don't they? You know, the chances of that happening, okay. And if I was then going to say, okay, someone's going to knock at your door tomorrow, and it's going to be at 9 p.m., and it's going to be a man, okay, I'm going to make it even, it's more and more difficult, isn't it? The more information, the more clarity I add to the prophecy, the harder it is ever going to be that my pro prophecy is going to be correct. Of course, I could knock at your door tomorrow at 9 p.m. and be a man, and I've got it exactly right, okay? But if then I was then going to say, and it's going to be a man who's six foot two, Counts me out, okay? It's going to be even more difficult. And if I'm then going to say, it's a man who's six foot two, who has blonde hair and green eyes, suddenly the odds of that are astronomical. Are they not? And if I'm then going to say, 
and this, he's going he's to knock on the door at 9 p.m. and he'll be a man who's six foot two, who's blonde and has green eyes and his opening words will be, I'm your lost brother, Gilbert. <laughs> okay, the chances of that happening are just astronomical. Prophecy is really, really easy if like Nostradamus, you're incredibly vague. But when you get to the kind of prophecy we find in the Old Testament, it is so detailed. They divide my garments. They cast lots. It's so detailed. But it is, as, it is just absolutely amazing. Do you know that there are 332 direct prophecies in the Old Testament that are fulfilled in Jesus? 332. The odds of that happening by chance are the equivalent of that equation. It's not the kind of odds I want to bet on. The chances of that being just by random by chance is those kind of odds. Do you get the picture? The more detailed the prophecy, the harder it is for the prophecy to be fulfilled. And yet we have constant prophecies in the Old Testament that relate to Jesus that are fulfilled exactly the way the Bible says they will be. One of the reasons you can believe in Jesus Christ with confidence. And what do we see in this? We see that there's a plan. And Jesus is part of that plan. And John recognizes that Jesus is part of the plan. So when he sees Jesus dying upon the cross, he's counting, ticking off other confirmations that this is actually meant to happen. And that Jesus isn't simply someone else being killed by the Roman Empire. He's someone who's in the plan of God because this man, Jesus Christ, is the Messiah. And so you see God's plan in this cry. And you also see in this cry also God's pain. God's pain. One of the things we understand about the whole crucifixion event is that Jesus really experiences pain really experiences pain. There's no divine cop-out in here. No sham or pretense. Jesus came to us as God in flesh. He literally took on your sins and my sins and he hung and he died as a human upon that cross in a human body, in flesh. You know, we mustn't it, it just kind of accept the kind of Hollywood um, rubbish you get so often about Jesus. You know, if he kind of floats into a room with a serene smile on his face and he kind of seems to be impervious to all the problems that he's facing. Often, according to Hollywood, of course, he's a, a white European hippie uh, as, as Jesus. That's the kind of picture they give. And it's not the picture of the Bible. It's not the picture of Jesus Christ. In the picture of Jesus Christ on the cross, it is messy. It is agonizing. It is painful. It is human. This cry shows us the human face of God. I said to you, one of the real problems of extreme um, first, you can get incredible first actually through fear. Being in a situation when you're really, really, really scared. Your throat dries up. And one of the Psalms in Psalm 69, it talks about the, the tongue sticking to your palate. That can happen through fear. And Jesus is in the cross. He's been on the cross for six hours. The sun has been beating down upon him. His tongue is sticking to the pallet. He is croaking. He is thirsty. You know, you must not get into that kind of um, idea that Jesus didn't experience death, didn't experience pain, didn't experience um, this, because it is very much the Bible's teaching that he did, literally. There's sometimes we see some, um, some of his teaching. It's an old a heresy called Gnosticism. And Gnosticism didn't believe that Jesus actually had a physical body because it believed that the physical body was evil. And therefore, Jesus had a kind of phantom body. When Jesus walked along, according to Gnosticism, that came about in the first, second, and third century, Jesus didn't leave any footprints because he had a phantom body. And when he suffered on the cross, he seemed to suffer. Another heresy called dotisticism means that seem to seem. But Jesus seemed to suffer but wasn't really suffering. That's not the God of the Bible. That makes no point. That turns Jesus into a deceiver. 
Jesus experienced the fullness of human life, but he could stand in the gap for you and me, but he understands what you and I go through. Jesus doesn't pretend to be a human being. He doesn't pretend to be in pain. He doesn't pretend to be in a thirsty. He is actually experiencing real thirst as he actually experiences being really abandoned by God in that first cry, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus is in pain. God is in pain. He's experiencing the reality of our human condition. So when you and I pray to him in prayer and say, God, do you understand? God will say, yes, I do understand. In fact, there's no pain or suffering that you can go through, but God hasn't gone through already. But he can't understand. As Hebrews tells us, he was tempted in every way as we are yet without sin. The word there, tempted, parasmus, literally means trialed. You've heard the expression trial by fire. Here is Jesus on the cross being tried by fire. He has been tested in every way as we have. And yet he's without sin. Jesus very much is on the cross. He is suffering. We see this again in that psalm we mentioned earlier on, Psalm 69. Verse 1, Save me, O God, for the waters have come up to my neck. I sink in the miry depths. Verse 3, I'm worn out by calling for help. My throat is parched. Verse 29, I'm in pain and distressed. When Jesus cries his cry, I am thirsty, it reflects the real human face of Jesus. He is in pain. He is suffering. He's suffering because he's cried out time and time again. Again, going back to Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me? So far from my cries of anguish. Jesus is suffering. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart has turned to wax, it has melted within me. My mouth is dried up like a pot's herb, and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You lay me in the dust of death. Dogs surround me, a pack of villains encircles me. They pierce my hands and my feet. All my bones are on display. People stare and gloat over me. Jesus is suffering. He's suffering for you and for me. God did not breeze through the crucifixion. He did not simply um, limit himself from the pain or, or, or provide some kind of barrier between himself and the pain. Jesus experienced all the fullness of that pain for you and for me on the cross. And yet I love John's gospel. Uh, John's gospel is... He, he writes, you know, he has seven, um, seven uh, I am sayings, he has a seven uh, discourses. Uh, he, has, he, he often uh, refers to the se- seven signs. He's got clear schemes going, going through his gospel. And one of the things that John tries to do, as I mentioned earlier on, is point out the fulfillment of Jesus. But he also tries to point out the deeper level of things happening. And when you read John's gospel, look at the words that are unusual. And there's a word that he uses, that, or detail here, that that's just passes over, that none of the other gospel writers mention, that's actually really important to this picture. And that's something he says in verse 29. And in verse 29, he drops a hint that none of the other gospel writers pick up on. He mentions the hyssop reed. A jar of wine water was there, and the, so they soaked a sponge in it and put the sponge on the stalk of the hyssop plant. And lifted it to Jesus' lips. Only John mentions that. Only John takes in that detail. Why? Is John just a bit like me, a bit OCD, a bit into detail? No. John sees huge significance in the fact that the soldiers take the stalk of a hyssop plant and lift it to the mouth of Jesus. Because John remembers what happens at the very, very first Passover. In Exodus chapter 20. Exodus 20, 21 and 22. Then Moses called all the elders of Israel and said to them, Go and take as yourselves lambs according to your families and slay the Passover lamb. You shall take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood which is in the basin.
and apply some of the blood that is in the basin to the lintel and the two doorposts. And none of you shall go outside the door of the house until morning. John suddenly sees a revelation. He suddenly sees what is happening here. But just as the children of Israel, the night of the very first Passover, had to daub their lintel and the posts around their doors with the blood of the Passover lamb, and by that daubing, the angel of death would pass over their homes, suddenly he realized what is happening. Here is a plan of God. Here is a plan of God. The hyssop is put in the wine vinegar that represents blood, that represents the blood of Jesus, and it's brought to the mouth of Jesus, brought to the mouth of the Lamb of God. And that cross piece becomes the doorway, the doorway to life. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He is daubing the lintel with the blood of the Lamb. But the angel of death may pass over those who believe and trust in the Lamb. What an incredible picture. Part of the plan of God for you and for me. That death may pass over us because of the blood of Jesus Christ. Because of the blood of him who suffered. Because of the blood of him who cried, I first. And so in this whole incredible picture, we see finally God's perishing. God's perishing. I am thirsty. You know, Jesus died before the, any, any other people died. There were three people on crosses that afternoon. And Jesus died at the, third, at the, the um, ninth hour, about three o'clock in the afternoon. And the other men ca- lingered on for a while until it was getting dark and and the priests were worried that they wouldn't be able to get them buried before the Sabbath day started, and therefore they'd be breaking the law. And so the, the, uh, the, uh, the um, soldiers were encouraged to go and break the legs of those who were still, uh, still alive. Remember that's part of the story? Because what happens is, is as long as you could keep your legs up, you could breathe. What would happen, crucifixion, was that suffocation. It would put so much pressure on your chest because you were trying to stand and keep yourself up, but you couldn't keep yourself up. And eventually the arms would become dislocated, and eventually the heart and the lungs would be competing with each other. And the lungs would often fill with fluid, and either they would drown in their own fluid, they would suffocate, or their heart would arrest, and they would die of a heart attack. It was a terrible means of death, and it could take, for some people, a couple of days to die. But factors like the sun and the heat and the time of year would make a difference in how long someone lasted. But when they were told to get the bodies ready for death, a soldier came to Jesus and realized he was already dead. Life had left him. And so that's the reason that that soldier took that spear and thrust him into the side of Jesus. And of course, Jesus didn't flint. He, he remained dead. And out of that wound, they were told, flow blood and water, a sign of a body that's already beginning to decompose. Why did not Jesus have his legs, legs broken? Why was he not? Why w- did he die so quickly? It's because he was thirsty. It was because he was thirsty for the, the fluid that had sustained him for eternity. His relationship with his father. Jesus, is, when he cries out, I am thirsty, he is not merely mentioning a human thirst, because we find after he was gi- given that drink of wine vinegar, he dies. It doesn't sustain him at all. It doesn't even elongate his life by a few minutes or by half an hour. He still dies because the first, the real first that Jesus is experiencing is the first for his father. The recognition that he's been abandoned, he's lost his relationship, he's lost the center of what he's designed as a human to be, which is to be in relationship with the father. It's the first that kills us spiritually. And that's behind, that first is behind all addiction. When we live in this world and we see people who have addiction, they're trying to find how to fill that void inside. And they try and some people turn to alcohol, they turn to drugs, they turn to careers, they turn to lots of different things to try and provide that focus that gives them a focus for life. And what the focus for all of us need is to know God. Because God made us, he made us that way. 
I've been a Christian many years, and it's that focus, that peace of knowing God, that anchor in my life that keeps me sane, that keeps me hydrated. Because without God, I too first. And without God in your life, without Jesus in your life, you will first. And unless you sate yourself and come to the living waters that is Jesus Christ, you will never know true fulfillment or that true sense of being full and cleansed. I first. I first. Let me encourage each one of you when you read and read this fifth cry of Jesus to realize it's not merely the physical side. It's also the spiritual side. And ask yourself the question, are you first in? Because if you are first in, the only way to sate that first is to come to the cross and ask for God's Son to fill you with the life-giving water that he offers us. Only he can truly fill us. Only he can truly bring us healing. Because it's by his stripes that we are healed. Jesus turned sin back on its head. He undid the damage that was done in Eden. He brings people the gives people the opportunity of again being able to walk with God like Adam and Eve did in the call of the day. That's what we're designed to be. We're designed to be people who know our Father, who know our Creator, and enjoy a relationship with Him. You know, I, I rejoice in this every day. When I take my dog for a walk, you know, as I walk through the, 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 uh, the, the fields behind, behind the house and feast my eyes upon the beauty, especially this time of year when everything's coming into life, I rejoice that I know the God that made this. I rejoice that it's made for a purpose, that I'm made for a purpose, and I'm made to know him. And as I see the beauty of, of, of creation, and witness the beauty of an animal like, like a dog you can have a relationship with, I rejoice in the wonder of creation, in the wonder that God has given us as human beings to live upon this planet. But I especially rejoice because through knowing his son Jesus, my first my first has been filled. Let me encourage each one of you to come to the cross and to have your first sated. Let's pray. Father, we come before you now and we pray that each one of us here may come and know the living waters, your living waters, Lord Jesus, in our lives. And Lord, if we're struggling with this and the terminology of crosses and crucifixions and all these pictures that seem to be so old, Lord, we just pray, Holy Spirit, that you may give us clarity to see things as they really are. Lord Jesus, speak into our hearts. Lord, may we realize that you died on the cross for me, in my place, to put things right between me and your Father to remove the obstacle of our sin and our willful, willful rebellion against you. And help us, Lord, we pray, to open our hearts and our minds to you, to invite you into our lives and to receive your forgiveness, to confess our sins and to let our sins go and to grab hold of your salvation, your forgiveness, your presence in our lives. Lord, pour out your Spirit upon each one of us. Flood our dry and weary souls. We ask, Lord Jesus, in your name. Amen. Let's stand and sing our final hymn. It's a wonderful hymn. How deep the Father's love for us.
His wounds have paid my ransom. Father God, we thank you that our ransom has been paid. Our sins have been nailed to the cross. Hallelujah. And to go with us now, Father, give us a good week. May each one of us know your presence day by day and help us, Lord, to carry this good news into this world that others may hear about Jesus, the Son of God, who died for them. Lord, go with us, we pray in Jesus' name.